Thanks for stopping by. So um, today I want to illustrate the concepts of close reading and distant reading, um, their differences and how they can be used together to understand content. So understanding a new concept, understanding a new idea, um, understanding new information. So um, I want to start today with this book. Um, this book is um, a, an interesting type of book because it is an edited collection. And what that means is that um, the, the person who edited this, Lars um, Bang Larsen, um, did not write all of the essays in this book. Actually, he didn't write any of them. Um, he edited them. So he pulled them together from about 30 or so different um, philosophers, theorists, scientists, and artists to talk about networks. Um, and to kind of give us a broad overview of what multiple different people from different fields think about networks. And so um, what's really great about edited collections like this is that it's kind of a really great way of distant reading because what it does is it gives us short excerpts from longer works from different authors and puts them together so we can kind of flip through, do a little bit of surface reading and understand a kind of wide um, general understanding of networks, as well as start to synthesize and notice the various difference and patterns among those different ideas about networks. The other thing about it is that we can also kind of do a deep dive. Um, so, you know, we can kind of go through the table of contents and kind of look and see, we can flip through the book, and then we can decide, all right, um, so maybe we're going to look at, you know, one particular one. I'm going to choose um, one particular writer here and one particular essay, um, and this is um, called um, uh, The Medium is the Massage, and it's an excerpt from a book by Marshall McLuhan. Here is the um, original book. Um, it was published in 1967. Marshall McLuhan um, is, uh, was a 20th century uh, communications and media theorist who really, um, in the 1960s and 70s, really started to engage with the public and um, use his research and talk to public audiences about how electronic communication was changing our society. And he really was important for kind of imagining and thinking about how the internet uh, would change society. The internet in the 19, late 1960s was mostly just an idea. It didn't really exist until a little bit a few years later. Um, but Marshall McLuhan's ideas is really kind of um, prophetic here. And, um, and I want to, you know, look at kind of part of this. First of all, Marshall McLuhan's main, uh, he had two main ideas. Um, one was this idea of the global village. Um, and what he said, I'm going to just read you a little bit of this. He said, ours is a brand new world of all at onceness. Time has ceased. Space has vanished. We now live in a global village, a simultaneous happening. Um, and actually, that quotation um, is so important that they actually put that um, in the book itself. And basically, Marshall McLuhan's idea is that we're all connected across the globe. Um, you know, this and and really, you know, I know this sounds like a kind of obvious thing, but in 1967, it really wasn't obvious. Um, and so we kind of saying we all live kind of in the same place and the same time when we're connected to each other in this digital way. Um, the other thing that uh, Marshall McLuhan is famous for is this idea of the medium is the message. And really kind of that idea is that how we communicate is just as important or perhaps even more important than what we communicate. And so, um, you know, here's um, a quotation where he says that he says, our electronic configured world has forced us to move from the habit of data classification to the mode of pattern recognition. We no longer build serially block by block, step by step, because instant communication ensures that all factors of the environment and of experience coexist in a state of active interplay. Now, both of those quotations from McLuhan's piece, and again, they only really took one page um, from that book. And you might think that, okay, I'm just gonna kind of skip over that, read that quickly. But here is where close reading comes in. 
those two quotations, they're really meaty, right? There's a lot of meaning behind them. They're not really obvious to us. It's not giving us information. It's introducing us to a really kind of um, you know, new paradigm, a new way of thinking. We're going to want to slow down drastically and really kind of think about those ideas. Treat each word as something that's really, really important. Slow down. Read that sentence a few times. You might even read this whole thing a few times to really kind of get that idea. And that's a different way of reading. We're kind of close reading and kind of going really really, really kind of deep in there. So once we do that, we can kind of slot that in to other different pieces. So now let's see, how does that look in the digital world? We're going to use a tool called Hypothesis. Um, it is a free tool. It's one of the ones that I might recommend for reading in um, internet-based environments. So um, check that out if it looks interesting to you. So the first thing that I'm going to do, um, since I'm kind of trying to understand a concept, I'm going to just throw it into Google and see what we find. All right, so I, I threw it into Google, and actually the first thing that comes up um, is a film, a 1976 film. And um, it's kind of a, you know, a, a satirical drama film. Um, this is probably not going to be super helpful for helping me understand the concept of network. So I'm going to have to think about my search strategies a little bit different here. So I'm actually going to go directly to Wikipedia. Um, and when I go into Wikipedia here, I see that we have a disambiguation page. And what that essentially means is that there's multiple different things network in the in Wikipedia refers to. So um, the first thing I'm actually going to do is to go to the Wiktionary, which is the Wikipedia dictionary. Um, and I'm just going to kind of get a, a understanding of the term by looking here. Um, and I can see here that a network, um, we kind of get a fabric or a structure um, of fibrous elements attached to each other at regular intervals. And I'm actually going to um, highlight that because I kind of like that idea. And I can, when I go back to that, um, and I can also see that it's a verb um, to interact socially, uh -huh, um, to connect. So we have this idea of interact and connect here. And this is helping me just kind of understand the concept. So I'm going to go back to um, the prior page I was on, and I'm just going to scroll through this. And, and scrolling is really something we do a lot with distant reading. Um, that idea of kind of surfing the web and, and scrolling and not spending so much time on any one thing um, is a way of understanding a concept by looking at multiple things and seeing the repetition. So when you're doing dis um, distant reading here, you want to be looking out for repetitions and patterns that you see. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit and see that um, the idea of network has, you know, a bunch of entries under science and a bunch of entries under technology and communication. I'm going to just click on biological network here. Um, and um, I'm going to see here, a biological network is any network that applies to a biological system. A network is any system with subunits that are linked into a whole, so there's species linked into a food web. I'm going to highlight that as well. Um, and I'm going to kind of scroll down and see that this is actually part of um, a whole area called network science. I'm just going to scroll down to see what that means in biology. Perhaps I understand a lot about biology and I can understand a little bit better this concept this way. And I can see that we have things like signaling networks, food webs, um, between species interaction. I'm seeing that, um, that word interaction a lot. That's helping me understand kind of what network is. I also pull up here and see that um, we also kind of have network um, science. I'm going to click on that and see what we get here. Um, and we can see that's an academic field which studies complex networks. I'm seeing complexity again. And we see different things like telecommunication networks, computer networks, biological networks, cognitive and semantic networks. And this is kind of getting me a little bit closer. And so I'm going to maybe spend a little bit more time on this page than I did before. And I'm going to kind of just scroll this slowly. So I'm, you know, still in the distant reading. I'm not maybe rating every word. I see that Wikipedia is actually made for this. It kind of has the um, topics. It's telling me things on the side. Um, so I'm going to scroll here. 
and see, huh, that Department of Defense initiative, that seems interesting. I might kind of take a deep dive if that was interesting to me. Um, I'm seeing a bunch of equations. I don't quite understand this, so I'm just going to keep on scrolling. And I'm seeing again some models, right? This idea of kind of having a node. I'm starting to see that word node um, here. And node related um, to kind of links, right? A node and an edge. Um, that's something that I'm seeing a lot with kind of these models of networks. I'm also seeing again some models of networks. I'm getting, it seems like there's a lot of different models and I might pay attention to these specific models. Who is Watts Strogatz or the Barabasi Albert model? So we can see that there's different models for networks. Um, we can see here that we could also analyze networks and different types of analytics. I'm also seeing this word dynamic a lot. Um, and so I'm also seeing this word link a lot. So this is telling me something about um, about networks. I'm seeing again this word complex, uh, complexity, complex network, spread of content in a network. And this is maybe actually getting me closer because we can see what are the, the ways that communication is maybe shared in a network. So I may spend, you know, um, some time kind of just kind of surfing Wikipedia and then maybe doing a little bit deeper dive. Um, on things that seem a little bit more interesting to me, but at this point I'm getting a pretty good idea of what network is. So let's pretend I've kind of done a little bit more of this and I've come across some texts that seem ones that I want to spend a lot of time on, ones that I'm really going to want to sit down that I know are maybe a little bit deeper, a little bit more complex, a little bit more authoritative than you know the ones that I'm finding in my Google search or Wikipedia. So one of the ones I came across um, was actually a documentary. Um, a documentary um, that's on PBS. PBS is a the public broadcasting system um, in the U.S. And I know that I kind of trust them. Um, you know, as you can see, I'm kind of a member of uh, my local station. Um, but it is member supported. Um, it is not for profit. Doesn't really have that much of a political agenda. Um, and they make really good documentaries. And so I would maybe kind of do a, a close reading of this and see, you know, okay, we have some previews here. Um, we're getting a little bit about kind of the history of social networks. That's why I know it, it, that it's going to be about. Um, and so what I'm getting here is, you know, just kind of a little bit broad overview and I can decide whether or not I want to watch it. Now, these are kind of fairly long. Um, there's three episodes and they're pretty an hour long each. Now, this would definitely be a kind of close reading thing um, that I would want to go in and spend an hour to really kind of really understand that and really understand that if I'm going to invest an hour, I really want to understand it. So that's where I would use those close reading strategies. Um, I want to demonstrate um, again on uh, some close reading strategies on text. And so imagine that I came across this one. This was another um, piece that I came across. And this is um, a piece um, that I came across through Googling. And, you know, I know from experience um, that, you know, this is um, a actually a scholarly piece published on Kairos. And I know from experience that Kairos is an academic journal. Um, I can see here John Jones, but maybe I didn't really understand that. So how would I verify that, you know, I want an expert telling me about networks. I don't just want some random person. How would I verify that? So, you know, just a couple of really quick things. I could look up the writer. Um, so I just typed in John Jones um, and rhetoric and I got his Google Scholar page and I can see here that he's published a lot so I know on this topic so I can understand his area of expertise. I can see that he has um, a lot of citations here and so by others so I can tell that he's respected in his discourse community. Um, and I could also look at the journal. So Kairos, even though it maybe doesn't look like a journal, um, is a um, refereed open access online journal exploring the intersections of rhetoric, technology, and pedagogy. Um, and so I know about this, but I can kind of see, I can check on that journal to make sure it's, you know, fairly um, authoritative and credible if, you know, maybe this is the piece that I'm going to spend time on. So I want to really make sure I go through that process before I spend a time on the piece um, in order to make sure that it's a quality piece. Is it worth my time? So um, I see here, you know, I'm going to just look at this page, what is network to kind of get a sense of how we might begin to, um, to start to close read this. 
so we see here, I'm actually first just going to, you know, um, look at um, the page by scrolling and I see again some different diagrams um, here that are very similar to the ones that I've seen before. So I'm getting a sense of, by distant readings, what a network looks like. And I'm seeing again, we have the kind of node here and the link. Um, and this is how we can think about networks and interaction. And that's something that seems to be fairly common across all of the different um, pieces that I'm looking at. So um, I'm gonna take a look at this and I see that graph theory, actor, network theory, and that's kind of how this page is divided. So I'm gonna understand just by spending a little bit of time scanning it before I do a close reading, that that is what I'm gonna get out of that. And so I'm not gonna you know, read kind of every word here, but I, cause I've already done it, but imagine I'm going through, I'm gonna take my time with this. Cause I know that this is an authoritative piece. I know it's gonna maybe really help me understand at a deeper level. And it's really gonna help me understand how network relates to writing. And that's really what I am concerned with here. Not so much about networks in biology. Um, so I'm seeing here, you know, that the graph theory, oh, and remember that um, person, Al, uh, those two people, Albert um, and Barabasi, um, we have here a, a citation from them. Um, and they had this uh, idea of network structures in terms of graph theory. Um, and they argued from a perspective that the graph theory, nearly everything is a network. Huh, that's interesting. Nearly everything is a network, noting that most events and phenomena are connected um, and caused by interacting with a large number of other pieces of a complex universal puzzle. Um, and I'm going to highlight that. I'm actually going to annotate um, that as well um, because I think that that is a really kind of um, great idea. Um, and oops, I'm going to do it that way. Sorry, I always kind of screw that up a little bit. It could be a little finicky. Um, and I'm just going to put like great, um, you know, quote. Um, everything is a network. You know, I'm going to ask a question because that's a kind of new concept to me. I might really want to think about that. So notice here that I've really slowed down. When I was really kind of looking for different pieces of text, I was looking at them really kind of very quickly, very fastly. Here, I'm really spending time because I really want to understand. I'm going to just slow down and really think about what I'm doing. I'm going to spend more time annotating. I'm going to spend more time highlighting. I'm going to spend more time just thinking. Um, and so I'm going to go kind of actor network theory here. Just assume that I've kind of read and thought about all of that. I actually might spend some time on this entire um, graph here. And I'm actually, um, you know, going to um, highlight this and kind of, you know, um, so I have that diagram of actor network um, theory, um, excuse me, actor um, network. Um, so I have that for later in case I want to go back to that. And what's one of the great things about these annotation tools? So we see here that um, actor network theory takes a different approach from that of graph theory. Huh. Um, and so I'm going to probably want to spend some time um, really thinking about that, right? Um, all participants in the network from people to events to technologies. Huh. So a participant in a network doesn't just have to be people. And I think that's really interesting, right? Because I mean, essentially, that's kind of what the internet is. It's a kind of a, um, you know, a, a participants of networks, uh, excuse me, a participatory network of people and machines. Um, and I think that's that's really kind of interesting here. Um, now, the next thing Latour says um, is, I think, really fascinating here. Um, and he says, a network is not a distant thing out there but it is rather an analytical device that is useful for understanding complex phenomena. Huh, as he puts it, a network is a tool to help describing something, not what is being described. So that's interesting. So network is not actually a thing, right? And I think he's kind of saying like, you know, we can't see it all the time, but we can imagine it and use it as a tool. I mean, I think, you know, essentially that's how we think about, you know, a social network. I mean, you know, we can't really see all of Facebook or Twitter or whatever, 
But what that allows us to do is we can imagine kind of how these things are connected, even though we can't, it's so complex that we can't actually see it. Huh, that's interesting. Um, and, you know, I'm going to spend some time really thinking and wrapping my head around that because that's a really kind of hard concept to just understand. So I'm going to really slow down, stop, go back, reread, take notes, think about it because it seems really complex and important to me in this moment. So essentially, I would go through the text in that whole way um, and really understand it. We can see here that's not long. So the idea here is that I've already kind of looked at a bunch of texts, and then I'm going to kind of do a deep dive, spend some time. Now imagine that I've already done, I've done that, and I want more information. Well, what do I do? Um, so I'm going to go to the references in this piece. Since this is a piece from an academic journal, it's going to have references. And I can maybe kind of go through, and let's say that, you know, I wanted, um, you know, more from Latour. Um, and I, you know, could kind of highlight that just so I can kind of go back to that. Um, and then I can start to see like, okay, well, where, you know, I have this book now, I can even kind of go get more. Or maybe I want to go, you know, look up um, Bruno Latour again, and I can find out a little bit more information about him. I can tell he's a French philosopher, anthropologist, and sociologist, and I could, you know, kind of see what are the things that he's written. Um, I could then go to find these books through the library, um, through, you know, other means that you're looking for. I mean, obviously you're going to use the library because it's free, it's cheap and easy. Um, and um, look at all the references here. And so I can start that distant reading process again, collect a whole bunch of text and then go back. If I go back to hypothesis, all of the annotations that I made are all there. So I can look and see which are the annotations that I've made. Um, I can go look at all of them and I have all of them here from all of the different things that I've done for distant reading. Um, I can go and kind of um, go and then even visit it in context. So I can go back to that and um, see here that they're still there and I'll have all of them kind of on the right hand side here. So um, it's a really kind of helpful thing for kind of collecting all of these um, things when you're doing distant reading, as well as a tool for really kind of going deeply for close reading. There are many different tools like this, so you know, choose one that works for you. Um, but here's one that, you know, try it out, I recommend it. Um, the last thing that you want to do is to spend some time for yourself really kind of clarifying what you got out of this distant reading. Remember, you're looking for these patterns, you're looking for these repetitions. What are the things that you see over and over again? And just jot that down. Um, you know, so here's just kind of at the end of my session, kind of jotting down what are the things that I've learned about networks. Um, really kind of focusing on the idea of nodes and relationships, links of things together, interrelated, interactive, complex systems, that networks can be inside of networks, um, and that really communication and writing in this age, um, in the digital age, are networked. And in a sense, essentially, that's what the digital age really is. It's an age in which um, things are networked through communication, our discourse is networked through communication. So I have kind of that understanding through both of the distant and the close reading. It's about varying these strategies for specific purposes. Hopefully you found that useful. Uh, thanks for your time, writers. See you next time.